PNR Networks is a member of Patreon. Show your love for our shows by joining our ongoing fundraising campaign and get some fantastic perks in return. Check it out and become a Patreon sponsor. You can sign up at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, backslash PNR Networks. And thanks for your support. Do you ever feel like you're normal and the rest of the world has lost its collective mind? Put your helmet on, we'll be reaching speeds of three. Do you find people saying this to you a lot? Are you totally deranged? Are you looking for a looking glass to pass through? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Or looking for a rabbit hole to fall down? Who could think of a better punishment, really? Everything's the same here, it's just a little worse. Guess what? Life's a bitch. Now so am I. You found it. (laughs) Welcome to Platinum Rose's Garden. Hello, my darlings. This is Platinum Rose Lady welcoming you to Platinum Rose's Garden on Sunday, April 29th, 2018. Okay, uh... Hi, I hope you had a good week. Um, my week was pretty okay, except for almost drowning a couple of times going to, going to and from work. Um, you ever have one of those, you know, that whole saying, um, you know, April showers bring May flowers and all that stuff like that. You know what else April showers bring? Water. Lots of water. All over your clothes. And all over your hair, so you have to shake like a dog and get hair, you know, get, you know, spray your hair all over the place and, and get wetness everywhere and soaking wet shoes and drippy wet socks. I hate that. I, I can deal with having wet hair. I can deal with having wet clothes up to a point. But damn it, I hate when my shoes get so wet that your socks get all squishy. Oh, that is the absolute worst. I realize it's a very visceral thing, and it's probably totally a me thing, but I just hate that. That is the absolute worstest ever. Can't stand it. Um, we are actually kind of looking like it's actually going to be kind of springy now, which is nice. Um, here in, it's been kind of one of those weird, um, um, weather patterns in Massachusetts this year. It's, it's kind of like we have winter, which is this big long stretch of gray and snow, and then spring, which is this teeny tiny little bit, and then summer, which is this long stretch of heat and humidity and mosquitoes. Ugh. Climate change? What climate change? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't go, I do not go in for talking about that stuff. That, that's like, I can't, I just can't deal. Cannot deal with it. I would rather deal with fun things. And obviously, fun things are things like Supernatural, although occasionally this show does break my heart. Um, but it also deals with other fun stuff and other fun uh, places to go and things to see, like on the interwebs and not those kind of places. And you know you go to those kind of places. You know who you are. Don't lie to me. But there's also the funnest place to go, which is checking out fan fiction. And that's what we're going to do next for our fanfic of the week. Okay, uh, this week's fanfic of the week, um, actually, <laughs> it kind of calls back to something that I did last week. You remember how last week when I suggested that wonderful fic to you guys about Castiel and, and Jack, that amazing fic? Um, and I had said, well, well, this is someone that I've actually suggested their fix before and I've never done this before and that kind of a deal. Um, well, to, to quote Britney Spears, oops, I did it again. Um, I can't believe I just fucking quoted fucking Britney Spears. Wow. <laughs> I really need some caffeine. Whoo. Anyway, uh, moving forward. We're over here now. Meow. Um, this week I actually did it again. I'm actually going to go back to a, an author that I have told you guys about before because he wrote another continuing piece in this series that he's been writing. And it is so 
freaking amazing. I had to tell you guys about it because everybody has to read it. Everybody has to go back and read his other stuff first because it kind of won't make sense if you don't. But it culminates in this. And I actually hope we get more because I love what they're doing. And I know you're going, oh, gosh, tell us who it is. You're driving us crazy. Come on. Uh, the person I'm talking about is Rogue Fan KC. That's capital R-O-U-G-E, capital F-A-N, capital K, capital C. Hey, again. Uh, this person has written some amazing fanfic for a ton of different uh genres, including Watership Down, X-Men Evolution, uh, Miscellaneous Cartoons, SWAT Cats, Looney Tunes, Charmed, Ghostbusters, Real ext- and Extreme, Hobbit, Thundercats, Kingdom Hearts, Sherlock, G.I. Joe, Justice League, Teen Titans, Thor, Avengers, and Captain America. <sighs> okay. You know, I, I really... Whew, breathe. Okay. I really should have taken a breath there. Wow. Oh, I'm seeing spots. Okay, I'm okay now. Um, this person has written some amazing, awesome stuff. One of the things they have written, which falls into the amazing, awesome category, are their, um, what I have been referring to, just, I made up the name on my own. If he doesn't like it, I apologize, but I didn't know what else to call it. His Marvel Lock series. His Marvel Lock series is a crossover between the Marvel Universe, specifically, I would say, the Marvel Movie Universe and the BBC show Sherlock. Um, They start, the series starts with, and I've mentioned this before, um, it starts with, he asked for his best shot, uh, followed up by Stars and Spikes, Sharing is overbearing and leads to swearing. A tisket, a tasket, I'm going to blow a gasket. And a dysfunctional rescue is still a rescue. And what's a birthday without an explosion? I like the way this guy thinks. Um, he has followed it up with his most recent entry into this amazingly funny, very action-packed, kind of romantic, very sweet, and I know certain people who are in this story would smack me around for calling them sweet looking at you Bucky Barnes um but he has continued it on with this amazing story that he graced us with earlier this month the name of the story is wear your deer stalker on your sleeve and the synopsis is thusly quote you are cordially invited to honor us with your presence of the dual at of the dual wedding between William Scott Sherlock Holmes, John Hamish Watson, James Buchanan Barnes, and Stephen Grant Rogers. End quote. Okay, I am I when I saw the synopsis, I was just like, Oh my frog. Um yes, I do use that term because Hello, blasphemy. Um, I, I don't really want to do that. And I was so excited. My hand was actually trembling when I clicked on the link to this because I'm just like, mm, this is going to be so awesome. And Rogue never, ever, ever disappoints. The story of the wedding between Sherlock and John and Bucky and Steve presided over by someone you're quite familiar with and full of guests and onlookers that you all know and one wedding crasher whom I won't say who it is. It is such a great story. It's sweet. It's funny. It's romantic. It's, I mentioned funny. That's actually not accurate. It's hilarious. And it follows up with an, with a, another chapter about what happened after the wedding. And I shouldn't tell, I shouldn't have to tell most of you who listen to this show what happens after a wedding. Bow chicka bow wow. Uh, anyway, um, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing piece of work. And Rogue, if you hear this, I hope this continues. I want to read more about these guys and their adventures and their interactions with other people. And you have such a gift. For writing, I swear, honest to blog, I'm listening, I'm reading this story, and I don't know if this happens with other people. When you read a story, do you hear the characters saying the words? I do. 
I, I, I don't know if that's because I have a, a vivid imagination or I'm just unhinged or both. <laughs> uh, normalcy is for the weak. Um, but I heard this story in my head. Every bit of dialogue, I heard it in Benedict Cumberbatch's voice. I heard it in Martin Freeman's voice. I heard it in Sebastian Stan's voice. And I heard it in Chris Evans' voice and the other people that were in there as well. I heard it in all of their voices because of Rogue's incredible writing and really amazing grasps of dialogue and character and stuff like that. So please, please, please check out Wear Your Dear Stalker on your sleeve. You can check it out over at fanfiction.net. Look up Rogue Fan KC in the search section uh, under author, and you can find his stuff there. Um, please follow it. Follow him. Um, and just go read his stuff because he is really fantastic. Um, and so that's our fanfic for the week. And as I said, I hope you check it out. I know you'll love it. And let's get to this week's Supernatural episode recap. Season 13, Episode 20 of Supernatural, Unfinished Business. Unfinished Business begins with the then, obviously, the then being about Gabriel, the Archangel. Gabriel, who started on Supernatural under a different identity. We knew him as the trickster, and he caused all kinds of havoc for Sam and Dean, before we found out that the trickster was actually the Archangel Gabriel, who had been hiding on Earth part of the time as the Norse demigod Loki. Um, Gabriel was hiding on Earth to avoid the fighting going on in Heaven. We thought we had lost Gabriel in Season 4, uh, Chariots of the Gods, when he was stabbed by Lucifer. As it turns out, we found out this season... Gabriel had faked his death, but wound up being captured and sold, for lack of a better term, or handed over to Asmodeus, who has been torturing him and feeding off of his grace for years, until Gabriel wound up being rescued and helped by the Winchesters to get his grace back, which he promptly used to fry Asmodeus. Not sorry about that. Um, but when the Winchesters asked him to help out with this whole apocalypse world situation, Gabriel said no and bounced. And now we are at now. Now, as it turns out, is Central City, Colorado, where we see a gentleman walking out of a liquor store. Um, I say gentleman, I'm being kind. Um, he's, he's a rather large gentleman and looks a bit seedy and more than a little bit scary. Um, he's drinking a bottle of liquor quite quickly. Um, when this music starts to play that sounds a lot like, you know, something you'd hear in an Enrico Morricone movie or in Kill Bill. Get used to that. There are a lot of Kill Bill references in this episode. As it turns out, the player of the kazoo, because you always think of standoffs with kazoos, eh is Gabriel, who recognizes this man, who also recognizes Gabriel, and the, he refers to this man as Fenris Odinsbane. And we see the imagery of a wolf over this man's face before he starts to grow fangs and claws and such. He and Gabriel engage in a fight during which Gabriel gets injured, um, but Gabriel winds up winning the fight by killing Fenris with a wooden sword, stabbing him through the chest, and uh, winds up, as I mentioned, winds up killing him. Um, and we get the opening credits, and we are at a motel where Dean is on the phone with Castiel. 
um, as Sam's trying to unpack, but Dean tells him not to bother. Um, the Winchesters are in this motel. They're obviously still trying to search for Gabriel, which is what everybody seems to be doing. Castiel's looking for him in Texas. Rowena has a tracer spell on him, and that's what got, brought the Winchesters to Colorado. Um, there's a knock on the door, and when the Winchesters answer, guns drawn, there's Gabriel, who they've been looking for, who is severely wounded, which we'd already seen anyway. Um, we cut to the apocalypse world, this world where Sam and Dean were never born, and Earth has been torn apart in a war between angels and demons. Um, Jack is updating Mary on a battle that he was in, where he mentions that he killed this this world's version of Balthazar. And Jack's feeling very confident. They have been fighting with Michael's forces. They've had three different battles recently with Michael's forces, and they've won them. Jack's feeling, as I mentioned, pretty confident, but Mary is concerned because she's happy they're rescuing people, but she's worried about dwindling supplies. They hear a noise, and they're both ready to attack. As it turns out, the noise is has been made by a human named Jacob, who is one of the resistance fighters. Um, he tells them the news that the, the resistance has found out that... Michael's fortress is being abandoned. The the angels that have been there are leaving, and nobody seems to know why. Uh, back in the Winchester's world, uh, we see Sam helping Gabriel with his injury. Gabriel's um, on the couch, and Sam's patching him up, being his usual sweet and caring Sam self. Hashtag loyal Samazon. Um, helping Gabriel with his injuries. Um, Dean seems to be a little bit... Dean's basically like, you're here, what do you want? Um, it turns out that Gabriel looked them up because he's low on his Archangel Grace and he was checking with the Winchesters to see if they had any more. Um, Dean winds up telling him the truth. They don't have any more because they use the what they had left of his Grace to open a rift between worlds. Um, y- it is very noticeable when Dean brings up the word rift, the look in Gabriel's eyes was, oh, that doesn't sound good. But he quickly kind of brushes it off with his usual Gabriel panache and gets makes like he's going to leave, but can't. Um, because if he's weak from blood loss and the big, you know, the big scratches taken out of his side, which are really actually pretty big, disgusting gouges of bloodiness. We cut back to the street in Colorado where the dead body is, and there are two men looking down at the body. Um, as it turns out, it's one of them's a larger, rather unpleasant, scary looking guy, and uh, the other guy is a younger man, younger, slimmer, thinner, looks better dressed, just kind of looks a little bit more urbane than his rather scary counterpart. Um, scary counterpart checks the blood that's on the ground and notes that it's Archangel blood, and they decide that it's time to call their father. And I have a very unpleasant idea of who these people are and who their daddy might be. Um, you, you never want to play who's your daddy in the supernatural universe. That never works out well. Um, we cut back to the apocalypse world and we see, we see through Jack's eyes the fortress that Michael has been inhabiting and it is empty. There, it's, it looks completely cleaned out. And Jack lets the the resistance fighters that he's with know that that there other than a few angels that are there, it's completely empty. Jack's idea is that he thinks they should check it out and find out why it's empty and what Michael's plans are. And he also seems to be of the opinion that Michael is afraid of him. And I'm sitting there like, oh, Jack. Oh, honey. Oh, sweetness. I, I, I know that your powers are really impressive and all that, but I think you're rushing a little bit too much. And so does Mary. Uh, Mary's worried that what, what, um, 
there could be walking right into is a straight up trap. Jack says that he can protect them. You know, he can protect all, you know, Mary and the other resistance fighters. Uh, we see Gabriel resting on the couch. It looks like he's asleep as Sam and Dean talk about what they're going to do. Um, Gabriel wakes up with a start and Jack, I'm sorry, Dean says that they need his help in what's going on. But Gabriel tells them, you know, basically once again is like, well, you don't have my any more of my grace, so I'm going to split. Um, the problem is that as he's talking about what happened previously and why he was hurt and who hurt him, mentioning Norse demigods, the door gets kicked in and guess who's at the door? And if you said the Avon lady, you're not right. Um, it turns out that it's the two gentlemen from earlier. And, you know, I'm pretty sure these are Norse demigods. Um, actually, I'm definitely sure they're Norse demigods. Um, which, which, and they're obviously, they know who Gabriel is, because the big scary dude's like, we're here for the Archangel, and Gabriel, I, I don't want to use the word hides, I, I, um, I, I can't come up with any other word other than hides, but is like, in another, he kind of ducks out of the action, Sam and Dean wind up fighting these two dudes, and... It's, uh, well, it's not a real great fight for the Winchesters, especially Sam, who almost gets completely choked out by the big guy, who gets killed by Gabriel, who kills him with one of these wooden swords. Um, so, <laughs> and as it turns out, Gabriel again tries to leave. He says he's going to go after the other guy, because as soon as the big guy gets killed and Dean tosses the smaller gentleman to the floor. Um, smaller guy bails the first chance he gets. Um, Gabriel says he's going to go after him. Dean's attitude is, I don't think so, and hammers home said point by producing a pair of handcuffs that we know are protected. So if an archangel is trapped in them, they're not going anyplace. Um, the... Resistance fighters obviously went along with Jack's idea because they show up at Michael's fortress and it is empty of angels. It's not empty of stuff because there is a table with a map on it and the map has a bunch of soldier, you know, like little green army men figures on it, but it's obviously not done in a playful way. Um, it's Michael's plans. Um, for what, we're not really sure. Um, but as it turns out, there's a few things Michael did leave behind besides army men and a map. Jacob comes back from a search of the dungeons, and he has someone with him, this world's version of Kevin Tran. Um, Kevin says because he couldn't produce, reproduce the spell that um, Michael wanted to use, and... Before he does that, Kevin does go into this very tragic story about how he became a, the, the prophet and all that. And he says that he couldn't do it anymore, it being the spell that opened the portal between worlds. Mary's actually very tender with him, which I was kind of surprised about. Um, as it turns out, Kevin tells them where, where Michael has gone is a place in the in the southern part of the United States where the walls between the worlds are thinner than they are here that Michael is planning to invade our well the, the Winchester's universe back in the Winchester's universe um Sam and Dean have, well, Dean, we're assuming just Dean, I don't think Sam went along with this, has, um, they've handcuffed Gabriel to what looks like a piece of the wall, the wall decoration or something. There's this little dividing thing between the rooms and there's little, um, little metal, um, you know, ornamentation and Gabriel's attached to that. Well, the chain, the handcuffs are, you know what I mean. And the Winchesters basically want answers. Um, so Gabriel provides them. Um, as it turns out, he hid out with these Norse demigods after the whole thing that happened with Lucifer back in season four in the episode Chariots of the Gods. Um, 
Uh, also, Gabriel brings up that they, they're not really demigods in the sense of usual demigods. These are more like monsters born, as he calls them, God-begotten monsters. I don't know if that makes things better or worse. It turns out that the the being that he had killed earlier in the episode, um, the one he 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 identified as uh, Fenrir Odin's bane, is a figure in, in Norse mythology that was called Fenrir. Um, he was one of Loki's children. He was this gigantic wolf, and part of the Norse mythology was that he would kill Odin, the king of the gods during Ragnarok, which is the Norse version of the end of the world, and that Fenrir would be killed by the Norse god of vengeance, who is called Vidar. Um, also, we actually had met, we've also actually known, known about Fenrir before because of the whole uh, thing that happened in the episode... Um, in um fresh i think it's uh fresh meat not fresh meat um what do you call it oh gosh um can't think of the name of the episode now uh the one where we found out garth was with sharp teeth thank you thank you world um the one my brain works like a pinball machine every once in a while the little the little you know ball hits something and the lights go off the episode where we found out garth had been turned into a werewolf sharp teeth um there's a cult called the maw of fenris and they considered this creature to be a deity, and they worshipped him. Um, and it was, you know, their whole thing was that they felt that, like, at, after the end of the world, Fenris would recreate the world where werewolves would be the ruling creatures instead of humans. So Fenris was kind of bad, and from the look of it, Fenrir wasn't very good either. Uh, the gods that Sam, or demigods, that Sam and Dean tangled with earlier on, uh, the big scary dude is a being called Narfi, who was a uh, Norse god of uh, trouble, I believe. Ca- you know, causing trouble, causing evil, that kind of a thing. He wasn't a trickster like Loki, who caused mischief. Um, the, the younger, slimmer guy is, uh, Slepnir. Um, Slepnir was another one of, uh, Narfi was one of Loki's children. Slepnir was also one of Loki's children. Slepnir in Norse mythology is a horse. Uh, before we go any further, I should bring up, um, Loki... Could turn the shape. Loki in North mythology is a shapeshifter. Also, besides being the god of mischief, um, one of his uh, adventures in shapeshifting, he mated with a horse. At, he turned into a horse and mated with a horse, and the result of said mating was Slepnir, who was a horse with eight legs and became the, the riding steed of Odin. So, just the more you know. North myth- Norse mythology is extremely difficult to follow. It's it's interesting and rich in interesting, fascinating characters, but it is very difficult to follow. So, back to the story. When all the bad stuff went down with Lucifer and and Gabriel needed to find a place to hide, as I mentioned, he went to these. Norse gods, and they, or demigods, and they hooked him up. They all were living the high life in Monte Carlo, gambling, drinking, porn stars, everything that, uh, you know, a, you could want if you wanted to hide out. But, as it turned out, stuff, the good times didn't last very long. Um, when it was very obvious that the apocalypse was going to happen, and it looked like Lucifer was probably going to win, the gods turned on Gabriel, kidnapped him, and sold him to Asmodeus. And that's where he was until he wound up being rescued. Uh, when Sam determines the reason that, that um, because Gabriel's 
low on Archangel Grace. That's why he's going old school and killing these pagan gods with wood instead of just smiting them into oblivion with his powers. Gabriel's response is, don't let anybody ever tell you you're just a pretty face. To which, um, Dean looks kind of like annoyed. <laughs> Dean looks kind of like, wait, I'm supposed to be the pretty one. You know, it's, I think he was kind of like, and also he was, I think he was a little like, did an archangel just hit on my brother? I'm not really sure. I, I think that also was a nod out to the Sabriel fans out there. I don't know. Um, as it turns out, the fourth sword, because Sam notice, notice, notes, that's the better word. Sam notes there are four swords, and so far there's three gods on, uh, demigods on Loki's hit list. He le an actual kill list, which we saw him with earlier, where he crossed out Fenrir's name. Um, the fourth sword is for the father of all of these three demigods, Loki, the Norse god of mischief, um, and a, and a trickster. And I also believe he was the Norse god of fire, but don't quote me on that. Um, Loki, who we see a shot of, who looks exactly like Gabriel, which actually really shouldn't be surprising since he hid his, since Gabriel hid his Loki for a long time. Um... We cut back to Apocalypse World, and Mary's whole thing is that they need to wait before they attack Michael and his forces. But Jack's whole thing is he wants to go now. He wants to take care of this now, get it done, get it over with. Mary pleads with him and asks for one more day. Um, Jack is reluctant to do that. He, you can tell he's really confident in, in his use of his powers, uh, because of the, you know, the success they've had with these other battles that he's mentioned. And I, why do I have this really uncomfortable, itchy feeling in the back of my head that the reason that Michael had, Michael has been letting Gabriel, sorry, Michael has been letting Jack win these battles, I just have this awful, awful feeling in the back of my head that Michael is sacrificing his forces, basically using them. Basically, Michael's doing a Magneto. Does anybody remember that line from X-Men The Last Stand? Magneto's line about letting the pawns go first and basically get sacrificed. Why do I have a feeling that Michael's taking a play out of Magneto's playbook? trying to make Jack think he's doing better when he when he's actually letting him win to increase his confidence to deliver a death blow later on. And I really want to be wrong about this, but I have a feeling I'm not. Um, Gabriel tells a little bit more of his backstory about how he met Loki and how this whole um, identity switch came about. Um, he explains that he was in that part of the, of the, um, world a thousand, e a few thousand epochs ago. I'm not entirely sure how long ago that is because I'm bad at math, but it was a really fucking long time ago. And he was in the fjords area and found Loki in a cave uh, bound and having a snake dripping venom into his eyeball. Blech. As he says. Um, this is also part of the, um, of Norse mythology. And Loki being punished for one of his many tricks. Loki usually, he played tricks on the gods a lot. And, um, it, but the thing is, and it all most of the time when he played tricks, they weren't nice tricks. They could actually be pretty nasty. Um, but he was usually forgiven for his trickery, and he did help out sometimes. And a lot of times, I think they kind of uh, the the gods' attitude seemed to be more or less like, "Oh, Loki, what are we going to do with you?" But eventually, Loki took it too far and wound up. Um, causing the death of another god, the god Baldur. And Baldur would 
wind up being in the Norse underworld until the destruction of the universe at Ragnarok. And he was, and he basically went around and, you know, said some pretty rotten things about Baldur. This was basically the point where the gods went, all right, that's it, we've had it. And you need to, you know, you need to time out. So Loki winds up chained up in this cave with a serpent dripping venom into his eye. As it turns out, Gabriel freed him. And then the whole mess started where his brother started fighting the whole Lucifer trying to seize power from God and, you know, the whole fighting thing that happened after that and the, his brothers fighting each other. And he said that he didn't want any part of it. He didn't want to pick a side and wanted out of all the fighting because he loved his brothers and didn't want to see them tearing each other apart. Their, his father, God, was had taken a powder. And Loki had owed him a favor, so he took Loki's identity. And Loki taught him how to act like Gabriel. So, I'm sorry, Loki taught Gabriel how to act like him. It gets confusing. So no one would suspect. Loki took a powder, and Gabriel became Loki and lived his existence for so long as Loki, as the trickster, which was how the Winchesters met him, and everything went along swimmingly until the whole mess that happened at the Elysian Fields Hotel where Loki, quote, quote, um, showed up and wound up fighting with his brother or pleading with his brother not to fight. And, you know, Gabriel and Lucifer had a tete-a-tete that didn't go very well, ending with Lucifer killing, quote, quote, uh, Gabriel. But as it turns out, he really didn't. Of course, also the Winchesters had known before that that the trickster really was Gabriel from the episode Changing Channels. Um, the thing is, the Winchesters, mostly Dean, are trying to explain to him that this whole, you know, this whole vengeance thing, Dean's whole thing is that it's not going to, you know, it's not going to help. It's not going to help you feel better. It's not going to change anything that happened to you and all this stuff like that and probably get you killed. When Gabriel starts raging, for lack of a better word, at what he went through, at what Asmodeus put him through, um, that, you know, Asmodeus had tortured him every day he was a captive, that he had, you know, siphoned off his grace and fed on it. I mean, how, can you imagine how humiliating and demeaning and debasing that would be for an archangel to have their grace siphoned off and fed to a, to a prince of hell? That would be unbelievably demeaning. And he's, he's furious. And he says, everyone who had a hand in it will die. Get me? And Sam's response is, yeah, we do. Because Sam knows exactly what Gabriel's gone through. I mean, Dean knows too. But Sam... I mean, Dean has done things in the name of vengeance, obviously. The whole chasing after the yellow-eyed demon for killing his mother and then killing, you know, John and everything like that. But when I think Dean's able to kind of step back and look at the bigger picture, I mean, killing the yellow-eyed demon opened up those gates, caused everything to happen, and, you know, got Sam killed. Dean had to make that deal, go to hell, open, you know, break the first seal, everything went to, you know, hell, for lack of a better term. I mean, Sam's done things in vengeance, too, obviously. Sam went after Lilith because she had killed Dean, and that opened the final seal and all this stuff like that. But I think Sam just knows... I'm not saying that Dean didn't know humiliation when he was in hell. I'm not saying that. So don't all the Dean girls jump on my back and start screaming and screeching at me saying, you you know, you're a Sam girl, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 because I will fight you. Hashtag determined Samazon. Um, but I just think that when it comes to things like the humiliation aspect of things and wanting hum- 
and wanting vengeance after feeling debased and humiliated, I think Sam taps into that more than Dean does. I, I just, that's my own personal opinion, and if you guys think I'm wrong, PlatinumRosel at Yahoo.com, spill your bile, I can take it, I'm hardcore. Um, as I mentioned, and, and I gotta say, this whole scene when Gabriel's talking, the, the way that it, it, it changes from, I can say this, and I say this as a fan watching this scene, the way it changes from, oh man, I feel so bad for you, you poor person, you're, I feel so bad and I'm so sorry this happened and I want to give you a hug, to, holy shit, now I'm really scared of you because your rage is fucking terrifying. That's, that's Richard Spate Jr. and the fact that he is an amazing frigging actor that doesn't get enough love. Um, Richard, you rock, dude. Um, but it was such an amazing, beautiful scene and scary. It was fucking horrifying. Um, Sam and Dean wind up talking together and, you know, it, away from Gabriel. Dean's all like, you know, the whole killing for revenge thing. Like I said, he's all, he's seen the results of that. You know, he's, he's suffered the results himself. He saw what it did to their dad. You know, but Sam's opinion on it is different. And I think it's because of what he went through with Lucifer when he was in the cage with Lucifer. I know he was tortured physically, but I really think that Lucifer obviously fucked with his head so fucking bad. And I have to be honest, writers of Supernatural, if Lucifer ever actually does have to die, it has to be Sam who kills him. I am not haggling on this. Sorry. Hashtag pushy Sam is on. Anyway, um, I'm sorry. And I, I also want to bring this up. And again, I realize all the Dean Divas out there are going to be lighting their torches and sharpening their pitchforks and coming after my, my self, my, my adorable self. And I don't care. But the whole thing about Dean bringing up, like, if you had a chance to kill Lucifer, you would or something like that to Sam. I'm like, no fucking shit he would, fucking genius, after what he went through. Fuck off! Why are you making him feel bad about that? Asshole. I'm sorry. Sorry! That's... I, I don't want people to think I don't love Dean. I do love Dean. I really, 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 really do. But there are occasions when I don't like him. And that was one of them. I wanted to slap his face. Um... Sam tells Gabriel that the Winchesters will help him if he will help them. And Gabriel kind of thinks about it for all of 2.5 seconds, and then you can definitely tell he's agreeing. Um, we cut back to Apocalypse World, and we can see Jack standing there looking down at this map of and the, and the figures on it and all that, and he's definitely... He is definitely planning something, and I just have this really uncomfortable feeling it's not going to end well. Um, as it turns out, Gabriel knows where Loki and Slepnir are. Um, that Gabriel, uh, Gabriel explains that Loki's whole thing is to, his whole modus operandi is to take the sleaziest, scummiest, most rundown hotel in town he can find when he blows into another town. And we see this happening as Gabriel's explaining it. Loki will find this hotel, turn the sleaziest suite he can find into a palace, you know, stay there for as long as he wants, you know, drinking, whoring, doing it up, whatever Loki does for fun. I'd rather not dwell on that. And then he leaves. And I'm assuming everything goes back to being sleazy again and the clock strikes midnight and all the Cinderella aspect of the whole thing. So Gabriel's known where Loki's been all this time, which Sam and Dean are both kind of like, damn it. Um, as it turns out, Loki shows his kill list to the, the brothers. Um, <laughs> Dean's less than impressed. I was kind of like, dude, I thought you'd actually think that was actually kind of cool. I mean, it's very melodramatic and terribly Kill Bill. I liked it. I thought it was pretty neat. Obviously, he knows what it's from since he brings up the whole Kill Bill vibe a couple of times and actually refers 
to Gabriel at one point as Uma, which I was like, look, at least he's not wearing a yellow tracksuit, okay? You know. Um, he's also not all that crazy about Gabriel's plan, which is basically just storm the place and kill everybody. Although Gabriel's whole thing is that, you know, he wants them, you know, he wants Slepnir and Loki for himself. Um, Mary, back in Apocalypse World, is pleading for Jack to go, to not go after Michael by himself, because that's Jack's plan. That's your plan. Go after Michael all by yourself. Fucking really? I'm, what? That's your fucking plan? I'm sorry, I might not be the greatest battle strategist in the whole world. Uh, anybody who, who's played D&D with me knows that. Uh, but, yeah, Jiminy Crickets, that's a horrible idea. And when Mary says to him, as she's pleading with him not to go, and I can't lose another boy, I'm like, all right, that's it, crying now. Thank you, Samantha Smith, for making me cry in the middle of an episode. Thank you so much. Damn it. <laughs> this show has really fucked with me. I am not kidding. Um, as it turns out, though, Jack can't leave. At least that's what Kevin says. Kevin, as it turns out, has a sigil carved into his chest, which we've seen before. Um, and he is rambling. I mean, rambling like crazy person rambling. Michael has promised that he will go to heaven, that he will be allowed to be in heaven if he kills himself and kills everybody in the room. Basically, Kevin's become a bomb. As Mary pleads with Kevin not to do this, that what, what happens in heaven is beautiful, but it's just memories. It's your best memories. It's not real. Kevin's, after everything he's been through, he's like, he doesn't care. Um, and he tells them that he wants it to be over, all of it. When Jack says that his spell won't kill him, Kevin's response is that Michael doesn't want him dead. Michael wants him broken. And he says, he said for me to tell you that even if you win, you still lose. I'm sorry. And he hits the sigil on his chest the room fills with fills with this bright light and as it, as that's happening jack grabs mary and we see the shadow of his wings around him as he wraps his wings around himself and mary as the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter and fills the room and we get a commercial ah! um we see slepnir with a couple of bodyguards walking into this kind of rundown hotel uh, in slow motion. Again, very Kill Bill, very Tarantino. Um, and they get in the hotel, they get in the elevator, they start to go up in the elevator, and we see Gabriel and the Winchesters following behind. And we see them get into an ele of elevator in slow motion. Very cool. With Gabriel standing in between Sam and Dean. It, it just, it, oh, it was shot so perfectly. Totally loved it. And they get in the elevator, and they're in, uh, this was just hilarious. They're in the elevator, and they're all looking so tense because they know they're going into battle. And the elevator music's playing, you know, some elevator music, girl from Ipanema kind of stuff. And um, Gabriel tells them that, you know, you can kill the bodyguards, you can kill the bystanders, you can kill whoever you want to kill, but Slepnir and Loki are his. He wants his face to be the last face that Loki sees. Um, the door opens on the elevator, and we're obviously in the hallway, and there's Slepnir and the two bodyguards. Slepnir tells the bodyguards to go after, you know, get him, kind of deal. Gabriel snaps his fingers, and the lights go out, and we wind up having a gunfight where everything's only illuminated by the lights from the guns going off. Oh my gosh, I loved how this was shot. This just looked so fucking amazing. When the lights come back on, again, thanks to Gabriel snapping his fingers, um, the bodyguards are dead, um, and Gabriel is standing over Slepnir with a sword pointing at him, and there is no sign of Dean. Uh, Gabriel runs Slepnir through, and Sam realizes, oh fuck, it's not that it's, it's not that Dean's run off, although 
Gabriel kind of tries to be like, you know, big brother is what are you going to do kind of a deal. Sam knows Dean would never run off. Dean would run forward into battle. And that's what he's done. He has the sword to kill Loki with, and he's run off to take on Loki alone. Um... Dean winds up facing off with Loki and gets things from Loki's point of view. The reason that um, Loki and his family went after Gabriel and pretended to be his friends and then sold him out to Asmodeus was as revenge for the death of their father, Odin. Because if you remember back to Chariots of the Gods, when Lucifer went on that pagan god-killing spree, um, o- Odin, the father of the gods in Norse mythology, was one of the gods that wound up being killed. Um, as it turns out, the whole thing really goes back to the fact that Loki and Gabriel had met and, you know, Gabriel had rescued Loki, and the whole thing happened as Gabriel said. But he left a little bit out, which Loki proceeds to tell Dean about. Loki had extracted from Gabriel a promise at the time when Gabriel had been like, you know, I'm hiding out from my family. Let me be you so I can hide. Uh, When Gabriel had asked that, Loki was like, okay, I'll do it. But you have to stay out of your family's affairs. Basically, Loki was saying, you know, you have to let your... Basically, Loki's whole thing was you have to let your family fight and do what they're going to do, whatever that is, including possibly kill each other, but you have to stay out of it. And um, Loki extracted that promise from Gabriel, and Gabriel had apparently agreed to it. But as it turns out, he obviously didn't because everything that happened in, you know, in changing channels leading up to Chariots of the Gods, which wound up with with um, Loki's father, Odin, being killed, which Loki blames Gabriel for. So he pretended to be to be still be Gabriel's friend. And when Gabriel came to him about the whole, I need to hide out again, he was like, sure, and basically trapped him to give to Asmodeus as revenge. He and, he and Dean, you know, kind of, you know, snark back and forth until Dean tries to kill him with the sword, and the sword goes through him because it's not the actual Loki. As it turns out, the real Loki is in the hallway, and he and Gabriel wind up having a physical face-off. And wow, is this not pleasant! This is one of the most nasty physical fights I have seen, never mind on this show, that I have seen in general. And the problem is that Gabriel is still low on Archangel Grace, and the bigger problem is Loki knows it. So this physical fight winds up being definitely more in Loki's favor than Gabriel's, and Gabriel gets severely bashed around. Sam comes running into the room where Dean and the fake Loki are and takes a shot at Loki before Dean can tell him no, and the shot passes through, and it's very obvious that it's not the real Loki. Um, As I mentioned, Loki and um, Gabriel are fighting in this hallway. Sam and Dean show up via the elevator, and uh, Dean kicks the wooden sword over to uh, Gabriel, who grabs it and winds up pinning Loki up against the wall, and Loki gets in some severely nasty personal verbal barbs, talking about how um, Gabriel only lives for pleasure and, you know, represents and stands for nothing, and that's all you'll die for, is nothing. Gabriel's response to that, although you can tell that Loki's words really, really hurt, is you first. And he stabs Loki, and Loki dies. Pulls the sword out, Loki slides to the ground, dead. And Gabriel turns and looks at the Winchesters, and there's a very brief nod, and 
I don't know what that was a nod of. I, I don't know if it was a nod of thanks or a nod of finality, kind of, you know, and it's over kind of a thing. Not really sure. Um, we cut back to Apocalypse World and Jack looks around, he kind of like, you know, brings his head up, looks around the room as he's, un, you know, taking his wings back away from himself and Mary, who's lying there unconscious. They're the only people left alive in the room. Everybody else has been eradicated by this human bomb that was Kevin Tran. Um, it's such a tragic, tragic shot because you can tell from the look in Jack's eyes, you can tell what he's thinking. This is my fault. This happened because of me and me being overconfident in myself and my powers. These people are dead because of me. Although Mary's still alive. Um, it's, there's no words and it's so tragic. It's so unbearably, unbearably tragic. We cut back to the outside of the hotel. We see Sam and Dean and Gabriel and Dean's putting the bag that Gabriel had the swords in, in baby's trunk. And as they're talking, um, it's very obvious that something has definitely changed about Gabriel. He's not got that whole kind of playful attitude anymore. Um, he thanks Sam and Dean for helping him. And he's, he, instead of being his usual, well, toodle, you know, toodle by and disappearing, he's going with them. He's staying with them. He's going to help them. Which, when they seem kind of surprised about it, he remarks, a deal is a deal. And if I'm being perfectly honest, tricks are for kids. Um, which, I I mean, he's no Lucy Lou, but Richard Spate did a really good job with that line. Um, I, I, I was like, yes, another Kill Bill reference. I love this show. Um, Dean goes to get in the car and Sam asks Gabriel how he's doing, how he feels. And Gabriel's response of that he feels like a whole new guy. Sam just kind of says, okay, you know, he knows how Gabriel feels. He knows what he's going through. And, um, there, there's an old saying that's been, um, that the, allegedly is an old Chinese saying that a man who is searching for vengeance must dig two graves, one for his enemy and one for himself. I don't know how, you know, I'm not sure how that applies here, but I do think when you kill someone, when you take another's life, it's, it's like <laughs> to quote, to quote Chris Cornell from, um, um, you know my name. If you take a life, do you know what you'll give? Odds are, do you know what you'll get? Odds are you won't like what it is. Um, we cut back to Apocalypse World. And it is just like I said. Uh, Jack blames himself for what's happened and for all the people who have died. And Mary is trying to comfort him as best as she can. You can tell it's, it's not real. I mean, it's helping, but it's also kind of not helping because Jack is just completely destroyed. I mean, he just knows that his actions are what led to these people getting killed. But Mary is explaining to him that you can't predict everything and you did what you thought was right at that time, you know, but I don't know if it's helping or not. Uh, we cut back to the bat cave and we find out from, from what Dean is saying, I'm sorry, well, from what Sam is saying, Dean's sitting there drinking and, um, I'm not knocking that he's taking a drink before anybody bitches at me. He deserves a drink after what they've been through. Um, he, Sam comes in and says, you know, Cass is helping Gabriel get set up and Rowena's helping out with her, you know, whole thing as well. 
and it sounds like the troops are getting ready for war. Um, but as they're talking, Sam brings up that, you know, Dean, something about Dean has definitely changed, and not in a good way, that Dean, what Dean just did was basically a fucking suicide mission, and he didn't need to even do it that way. You know, it's, it's like, what the fuck is your deal? Why are you trying to kill yourself? Um, and Sam brings up that, that Dean's changed since he went into that rift, um, with, with Ketch. You know, the whole thing when they went over there to try and rescue, you know, their mom and Jack that first time. And Sam's, basically, he asks Dean, why, you know, why are you treating me like I, I belong at the kids' table, you know? And it's not, it's not like before. You can tell that it's not like it has been in the past where Dean had Sam stand off or stand down or not help out because he didn't trust Sam. It's not like that because there were times he didn't trust Sam. He admitted that. But he says that and he he says these lines, and I'm just like, I, I can't fucking deal with this show anymore. He talks about what happened the last time when the apocalypse almost happened. He talks about how Sam had died and Sam had gone to hell. And he talks about that this time the, they're not looking for the apocalypse. They're, they're, the, the apocalypse isn't looking for them. They're actually looking for for the end of the world themselves. And he says, I don't care what happens to me. I never really have. But I do care about what happens to my brother. Sam an Sam answers him, Dean, we're going to that place and we're going to save Jack and Mom together. And if something happens, we'll deal with it together. And if we die, we'll do that together too. And Sam leaves, and Dean's kind of just sitting there thinking about what his brother just said. And the episode ends, and I'm sitting there trying, trying not to cry, uh, you know, as I'm trying to write down my notes and things for this episode with tears in my eyes, and I'm like, damn it, this show is going to fucking kill me. <laughs> You know, oh my gosh, this episode was so fucking amazing. I have to give Unfinished Business five bouquets out of five. Absolutely fucking loved this episode. Uh, directed by Richard Spate Jr., who knows how to break my heart in about 97 different ways. Um, and I want to bring up Meredith Glenn, who wrote the episode. Wow, you knocked this out of the fucking ballpark, Meredith. Seriously. Fucking amazing episode. The ending just, I was like, all right, that's it. Totally crying. Uh, <laughs> which I'm going to lead, this is going to talk about something else in a second. Um, this season, I think, has been one of Supernatural's best. And I can't believe we're actually at episode 20. That's just crazy. And that leads us into next week's episode, episode 21, Beat the Devil, where we know that we're going to see Lucifer again. We know that stuff's getting, you know, I mean, if, if anything could get any more real than it is now, I don't see how that's possible, but it's going to keep, it's got to, there has to be a light at the end of the tunnel, folks, and hopefully it's not an oncoming train, and hopefully we'll all be there together to see what happens. Because we're all going to have to prop each other up, right? Before I ride off into the sunset, cats and kittens, uh, I want to talk about something else that obviously everybody who is a comic fan has been waiting for for months and months and months. Um, Avengers Infinity War came out this past week, and um, me and TC happened to catch it on Friday night. Holy shit. Um, I will not spoil this movie for anybody. Um, I will not tell you what happened. Um, I will tell you, uh, that I, I will give you a hint. Little hint. 
Um, if you are a person who is easily, um, if you cry easily, bring tissues. Actually, fuck that. If you cry easily, bring a sponge. Bring a sponge in a bucket because you're going to need it. Um, it's a great movie. It is hysterical in some parts. It is gut-wrenching in other parts. Holy fucking shit, this movie rocks. Um, but it re- I, I walked out of this movie and I, I didn't have a moment like I did at the end of The Last Jedi. I didn't lock myself in the bathroom and cry for an hour sitting there rocking back and forth. I was really not a poster child for mental stability at that point. Um, but it, it's an amazing movie. It did sit with me. And I think I have cried more in the past three days than I did during the entire month of April. Thank you so much, Avengers Infinity War and Supernatural. Because... I my eyes are all red and puffy and I look a fright. So, thanks so much for that cuz I wasn't a beauty queen to begin with. So, anyway, moving forward. Um if you guys have any comments, questions, queries, complaints, anything you'd like to send my way, your opinion of supernatural season so far, anything like that, uh please send them to platinumrosel at yahoo.com, put PRG in the header, and I know you will you want me to read them, and I will definitely do that. If you would like to follow me over on Le Twitter, you can do that over at uh Twitter. I'm Platinum Rose Lady over there. If you would like to check out my Meager contributions to the world of fan fiction. You can do that over on fanfiction.net. I am over there. Search for Platinum Rose Lady in the author search category. And you can do the same thing over at an archive of our own dot org. Um, and I hope you will follow the other shows that me and our little island of misfit toys that are our, our internet family are involved with. Um, <clears throat> my other solo show is, uh, Ring Around the Rosie, which is my wrestling podcast. Uh, this past week was a little serious, more serious than other weeks, because usually I tend to be kind of, you know, bouncy, my usual bouncy, irreverent, kind of wacky, doesn't take anything seriously self. But this week I was a little more serious over there, and I hope you will check it out over at ringaroundtherosie.net if you are so inclined. If you are also so inclined and you'd like to hear more of my melodious voice, uh, you can go over to Subject Cinema, which is me and my sweetheart TC, who puts up with all of my shenanigans, melodrama, and all-around drama empressness. Um, and you can check us out. We do movie reviews and movie pod, uh, and our movie podcast, Subject Cinema, news and all kinds of fun stuff to do with movies. We're do, we're, we're gearing up for our summer preview issue because we all know that in the summertime is when all the big movies come out and that's always exciting and cool. Um, we also have another show that we do together. It's our list show, Front Row 5 and 10, where we'll take, uh, one list of 10 things or two lists of five things, and they're lists from all kinds of things, from movies and books and podcasts and, uh, comic books and all kinds of crazy things. Uh, this past week, our show was, and we do each our own separate lists, um, his and mine top 10 favorite music videos of all time, and that was a Hell, a lot of fun. So I hope you go check that out. TC, being the enterprising guy that he is, also has uh, some singular podcasts that are singularly him. And one of those would be Catastrophe Vortex. That is his look at disaster movies because he is a disaster movie junkie. And if you like movies about things that go crash, wham, and boom, you can go check him out over at Catastrophe Vortex. He also has two shows that are very helpful if you're looking for where to spend your hard-earned ducats. Uh, you can go listen to him on Tuesday Digidex or Three Minute Weekend. Uh, those are his shows where he is looking at what is going on, where you can go check out new movies, new releases at the theater, new releases on on demand, all kinds of fun stuff there. Um, and, you know, on new videos coming out and all kinds of fun things. He works really super hard on that. And I hope you guys will go check that out because they're really cool little shows. Uh, there are also other shows that are part of our little family. They would include... 
Cave Babble, which is Eric and Valerie and their families, and talking about movies and games and Cave Babble Eats Odd Things. There is Comic Grotto with Aunt B and Pee Wee, which is a comic show. These are two guys that are really knowledgeable and lots of fun. Uh, TC is also doing something else that I wanted to bring up to you guys because he's working super duper hard on this. And this might be a little bit more for those of y'all over on the continent, um, but I hope you'll check it out. Um, he has been working on a Eurovision project over at our Planet Biblio Musica site. Um, he is a big fan of the Eurovision Song Contest, which America has been able to see the highlights of the last few years thanks to the channel logo. So he's been looking at all of the nominees and doing some really, you know, a lot of research and stuff like that. So hopefully you will go check that out at Planet Biblio Musica. And if you would like to check out some of our work in um, <clears throat> a more theatrical bent, you can do that by uh, going to Google and searching for Project Hammerdown. Project Hammerdown is an audio play that TC wrote uh, because he's super crazy talented. And it's got all of us involved, everybody from um, him and me to Eric and Valerie and their family and Anthony and you know folks over at uh, Comic Grotto. It's celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the film Cloverfield and what else was going on that night when something came out of New York Harbor and wreaked all kinds of havoc. It was a lot of fun, but definitely a labor of love, and I hope you'll check it out over at Manhattan Hammer Down. Just search for it on Google, like I said. And that is going to do it for another week here on Platinum Rose's Garden as Supernatural's season winds down. We know they've finished filming for the season. So to Jared, Jensen, Misha, and everybody else that's part of the Supernatural crew in front and behind the cameras, I wish you guys a super happy uh, time off. I hope you spend it with your families and have great, fun, wonderful times. We thank you so much from the bottoms of our hearts for all you do for us. Um, we don't deserve you because you're all totally awesome for putting up with all of us loonies. Um, but have a great summer, you guys. We're not done yet. We've got a few more episodes to go, and you got to come back and check me out because I'll definitely be here. But this is Platinum Rose Lady signing off for another week, reminding you to hug the ones you love, hu- love the ones you hug, and take some time to stop and smell the roses. Bye. podcasting's choice from coast to coast continent to continent right here 24 7